And what does it mean for casual fans when suddenly it's like, oh, I can't get that comic because everyone scooped it up and flipped it online for a ton of money. Like we talked about it before. That's the problem that we see with a lot of speculation stuff is the scarcity impacts the worst, the casual fan who then can't read a story and then doesn't buy the next issue. And they're the reliable customers. For any occasion, so keep patting down, waiting. Comics and conversation, keep the conversation moving along. Keep bringing comics, keep your local store strong. If it's hard, then it's a job for the challenger. Comics and conversation, y'all. From Challengers Comics and Conversation in Chicago, this is Contest of Challengers, a comics industry business podcast with Patrick Brower and W. Dell Bush. Hey, Dad, look at us. We're doing a podcast. Look at that, Patrick. We, we've done a lot of these, haven't we? We've done more than one. I believe this is number 545. That's ridiculous. That's and, a high number. And while this is a comics industry business podcast where we talk about the things in the comics industry that uh, affect how we run our business, mm -hmm. it's not just things in the comics industry. It's things in the store itself and things we're doing. And uh, I'm going to be... My voice might be cutting in and out because I'm going to be doing a lot of leaning and rocking. Okay. Because my leg really hurts. Sure. That's a thing that happens in the store a lot. Yeah, your, it does. Your leg hurting? It does. I was I was up and down a ladder for many different reasons today, and uh, I think that might be a bad idea. I think Probably, I might, I might yeah. need to, to not do that anymore. Yeah, agreed. But one of the things we do is is ring up comics when people are buying them. And we have yeah. what are called in the industry customer interactions okay sure now most of the time they're fine yeah i, I hope so <laughs> i hope uh, they're fine sometimes they're enjoyable they're pleasurable they can be sometimes they're you know not a chore mm -hmm. and sometimes they are bewildering okay and we each have a, of some stories to talk about today. Oh, gosh. Okay. I'll remind you of yours. Thank you. You always have to. <laughs> because I, I know you don't remember it. I don't. <laughs> uh, when That's the... my defense mechanism, is not remembering any of this <laughs> stuff. I don't care. <laughs> what happened? Who knows? <laughs> the more I remember of it, the more angry I get. You heard last week's <laughs> podcast. Jesus. <laughs> Let me start off real quick by saying one really good thing that happened with Comic Suite this week, because I know I was very um, angry about how... Our Subscription management software, Comic Suite, and the wait, online wait. service pull box were going. Were you angry yet last week? Can't remember. I don't think anyone noticed. Can't remember. Um, so one of the things that I think I'd mentioned last week that was upcoming that we were having to, to account for was that Marvel Comics, uh, for us, were going to be ordered from Penguin Random House for the new catalog, not from Diamond as it had been for decades. The, the last decades. Um, and the concern was how that would work with... The way Comic Suite pulls special orders. Basically, what you're doing um, when an order comes in for something that you haven't already ordered is like if a customer order comes in for a variant that we had not previously ordered for the store, Comic Suite's going to try and create a reorder for that to send to the appropriate vendor. Well, the problem is, like, for the next uh it's october eight, shipping books eight weeks we're still getting marvel stuff through diamond and then on the ninth week and forward we're getting marvel stuff from penguin random house so if, and then strays from diamond late books things yeah, that yeah I, I think most of that stuff they're working hard to basically have a cutoff like all the graphic novels and stuff that were originally ordered before the penguin random house deal yeah we'll be and out then by we're then. scheduled for november we're all canceled and they're like we have to re-foc these because you have to have a choice as to whether or not you're getting them from one discount from Diamond or a different discount from Penguin Random House if you have accounts of both. But anyway, so let's say someone wants to order a variant cover for X-Men number three, which is going to come out under the terms of the Diamond part of, of the Marvel Diamond deal because it's going to be before Penguin Random House has the rights to sell Marvel books to comic store accounts. I'm with you. So the problem is we have to switch over in the system now as in we already did it this past Wednesday, um, that Marvel is a vendor we get through Penguin Random House in Comic Suite. So as we're doing the new catalog, it separates out all the Marvel stuff in the catalog into a separate thing that we upload to Penguin Random House, the same way it currently separates out all the DC stuff to go to Lunar. It doesn't try to order either DC or Marvel stuff through Diamond because we don't order those two publishers from Diamond as of the new catalog. 
and it knows that. It knows that. The you, system yeah. knows that we're not doing that. Yeah, we, we go into supplier maintenance, and we specifically say, this publisher, this vendor, and it separates it out. Um, so the problem we were going to have... And we learned that a few months ago when we were practicing with it and assigning vendors to things and then realizing that when you do that it doesn't pull their books into the catalog remember that uh it yeah that whole group of yeah of you books went through, I couldn't find you couldn't find any of the manga stuff because at the time i had put and then we basically figured it out um but anyway so hypothetically what we were worried about i was worried about was that if someone ordered a variant cover for x-men number three that we had not ordered for the shelf because marvel has dozens of variants every month that we don't order for the shelf and we get a lot of people at the last minute asking for them uh, by final order cutoff three weeks before the book comes out or sometimes the Monday before the book comes out. Yeah. What we what I was worried about was that it would essentially create an order where it says, okay, cool, well, someone wants this Marvel book that you you didn't order, so you need to order it from Penguin Random House. And we'd have to go, okay, but Penguin Random House doesn't carry that book. We need to get it through Diamond. How do we get Comic Suite to understand that that particular Marvel book needs to get ordered from Diamond while everything from the current catalog gets ordered from Penguin Random House. And I had a little hiccup in the system, but then I fixed it, and I fixed it in a way where I'm like, oh, this is the smartest way Diamond could have possibly handled this situation. What they did was they created a new publisher in their database called Marvel PRH. Oh. That publishers everything that is being distributed by PRH and then sub-distributed by Diamond. So, like, the X-Men number three variant that is only being carried by Diamond is under the publisher Marvel Comics. Everything in the new catalog is under the publisher Marvel PRH. So, basically, they set it up so that as far as Comic Suite is concerned, those are two completely different publishers once the switchover happens. And you can do it in your system ahead of time because it doesn't matter. And I'm like, that's great. Hopefully it'll work out the way it seems like it's working out. But currently, all the data seems to suggest that Diamond did it in the smartest way they possibly could have. And I applaud them for it. I honestly feel like that's a solution you would have come to. It's a solution that when when I tried to figure out why it wasn't working the way I thought it was at first, and then I found it, I'm like, that's so smart. So yeah, maybe I would have eventually come to that. But I like that internally when they had... A lot of runway to figure out how to deal with the switchover, unlike with DC Lunar, where they had zero runway. Uh, they came up with a really elegant solution, and I like that. Nice. So uh, kudos to uh, Diamond and uh, PRH for figuring out a way to make that all work. And the new distributor, Diamond PRH. <laughs> yeah. Kudos to them as well for existing uh-huh. and making life a little bit easier. So while last week I was very upset with uh, all of our various... Uh, point of sale and software vendors for uh, making my life miserable uh, this week. Not only did they, they didn't fix the problem that we were having where it was reactivating uh, old subscriptions, but they figured out why it's happening. I mean, to be fair, I also figured out why it's happening and I kind of said, here's what we're seeing. Uh, and they confirmed that that is what I, I, what I was seeing was what's happening. Now it's more just a matter of like talking to the program, figuring out like, okay, how do we solve this in the best way possible? So they took a backup of our database, and they'll look at it. And in the meantime, they also helped us with another problem where there were a few special orders that had been kind of rendered into ghost special orders because of problems with the DC product codes. One of them were mine. One of them was yours, and you had actually said to me earlier in the week, like, I don't know why this didn't get pulled for me. I went in a bunch of times, and it's like, it, because it somewhere between you adding it and you posting it, it kind of vanished, and you couldn't post it, and that was the problem. Um, but unfortunately we had an, another hiccup where, Actually, uh, yeah, what I said was, I don't know why you didn't pull this for me. You true. know, I was down for it. Cause I'm bad at my job. Uh, Eric, uh, who recently won one of our hero trade contests, uh, had a problem a month ago where an, he had placed an order for a future state Gotham cover B variant. And that's not one we stock for the shelf. And for whatever reason, that order didn't come through pull box to get to us. He had, unfortunately, as I found out on Wednesday, a similar problem with issue four, where it became a ghost Ugh. special order. And we found it after FOCs. <laughs> so I'll have to tell him on Wednesday, like, hey, man, uh, I don't know what's going to go on with that 4B. The good news is when I reordered the 3B, it did eventually come in. So hopefully 4B will just be another one where I don't know if you're going to get it the week it comes out. You may get it a couple weeks later. So, obviously... It's a punchline cover, though, so I, no. I'm the guy who does the DC initials and the FOCs, and mm. obviously I check every book 
to see if we need any other B covers. Right. And part of me, of like a few months ago, thought maybe I should just always get B covers just in case someone adds it at the last second, just in case sure. it happens. But our B cover sales have been terrible lately, and it's an, it's not a good idea to do that. I mean, off chance somebody might order it last minute. It's like rewarding their bad behavior. <laughs> That's true. And also sticking us with the covers. So I don't. I don't do it. No. And then when I don't, it's like, oh, we should have. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of times where, like, something comes in late, and because of the way that the DC and Lunar stuff still isn't kind of working right in Comic Suite, we do have these little hiccups. Um, thankfully, they're few and far between now. We're getting people doing less last-minute uh, cover B orders for DC stuff. Largely, it's people saying, like, I want Batman cover B long-term or Flash cover B long-term. Yeah. Rather than like, oh, I heard this one variant is cool. But yeah, I mean, certainly you look at um, a hot book like Nice House on the Lake number two. Uh, we still got like seven copies of the cover B. People did not seem to care a lot yeah, about that. Yeah, right? So that's that's and another, it's a, that's it's another a, point. It's a fine cover, but yeah. Uh, and and like uh, the um, the Super Sons cover for Superman Son of Kal-El number one. I thought it was a good cover. But it's the one that people keep passing up. I had yeah. to tell a couple people hey, we still have number one on the shelf. And they're like, where? And it's like, oh, it's this cover. And it's like, oh, they genuinely did not think that cover was going to be for Superman, Son of Kal-El. Yeah, it looks like it's just Challenge of the Super Friends. Yeah, it, so, Super it looks I like it's it. for a different title entirely. I it. Yeah, I, on the one hand, yeah, I mean, there's certainly is there the idea of what if we just got one or two of every cover be just in case someone at the last minute said, I want that. Um, but that adds up. That, that, yeah, uh, that it becomes, does. That becomes unprofitable. As um, someone who did DC Returns today, I can tell you, yeah. Well, certainly we have talked about... Um, Never the, carrying DC Comics. You're right. The hope of uh, Manage Comics as a replacement for Comic Suite and Pullbox and uh, RMH. And one of the things that you were very excited about initially was when I told you, oh, basically how the subscriptions work in Manage Comics are the cutoff is final order cutoff. Yeah. So one of the things I don't like about Pullbox, mm -hmm. like I love that people can go through the catalog and find weird stuff we don't have that are still available yeah. backlist items sure uh hellboy mugs things like that <laughs> sure love it what i don't like is when a book is already out uh -huh. and somebody adds that issue on pull box sure like, just come get it off the shelf or email us like don't yeah adding it through pull box is extra steps that make it awkward yeah and i mean that's one of the things that, that's advantageous about something like managed comics is that uh you can't really do that and it's on the same site that we sell things on so if it's a brand new book and we've got it, you can just go in and buy it from Shopify. We're done. Yeah. Uh, if it's one that we don't have in stock, then you need to contact us and say, please get this for me. Because oftentimes we can't. If yeah. it's a brand new book and we don't have it, nine times out of ten, sold out. Can't yep. get it anymore. Like somebody uh, this week added uh, Moon Knight number one, first print, cover A, yeah. through pull box. I saw that. I had to go, saw sold that. out. <laughs> so I thought that was out. ridiculous. Which, I mean, in, in fairness... I don't blame them for doing yeah, it. Yeah, Pullbox doesn't have anything den denoting, like, stock levels at this distribution level. We can see that immediately, and we know all, from release that that book sold out at, at the distribution level. But when you're doing it through Pullbox, it's just like, oh, this is the book I want, I'm going to ask for it. But yeah, I mean, certainly the idea of... The, beyond the managed comics of it all, it's something that we need to kind of reinforce a little bit later in the year... Once things are a little bit more steady as far as our workflow and our infrastructure tools go, is really drilling into people the idea of you gotta let us know by FOC if you want something. After that, you are rolling the dice. Like, I there are so many people now that are doing, that are basically waiting for YouTubers to say what the hot books are going to be and then reserving them all. And it's like I don't like that. I don't like that as a a, a reservation system. Like. There were books that were coming out over the summer that we were just telling people when they were calling on Wednesday, yes, we have it on the shelves. No, we're not going to set it aside. Yeah, for real. It, you, you just come in and get it. First come, first serve. That's the way it feels fair. So basically having like a loophole for that where you can join our subscription service and ask for it the Tuesday before or the Wednesday before. It's like, no, I, I want to keep our, I want to turn our, our subscription service back into subscriptions. Yeah. If you want to pre-order something, you got to let us know before the orders close. After the orders close, you get it off the shelf. Every that's it. comic that's, shop, that's how it should work. Has the same rule for the most part for 
people that want incentive covers and things like, oh, you want the one in 25? Buy 25 copies. <laughs> sure. But nobody ever asks for those things before FOCs. Nobody asks for the hot books before FOCs. No. Like, so, like, as far as, like, you want, oh, you want Red Room number one, cover B? Yeah. If you let us know before we place our orders, you can order 2,000 copies. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> right. But if you want 2,000 copies after it comes out, no. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. We're getting a lot of people that are doing the, like, oh, I want all five copies of the new printings of Stray Dogs after the orders close. Pull box is not set up to not do that, and we could we could immediately just say to everybody who's putting in an order, no, it's after FOC, I'm not ordering it for you, and that's a thing that we're probably going to end up doing yeah. <laughs> eventually. But it's going to come with a, an email to subscribers saying this is how the system was supposed to work, and it's basically strayed from that entirely yeah. into something that is more. This is the hot book. Let me put in a pull for that. No. Not doing that. And Tired of doing that. I think people will understand and they'll get it. I don't think anyone's going to be mad about it. And it's just, it's the level of frustration that it builds in us has a tendency to make us, and me, when I say us, I mean me, mm -hmm. but you, but me, me too. Yeah. be a little more blunt in how we explain it. Yeah. Because we're frustrated by it and people are mainly rational and understand. Like, right. I can't tell you how many people who have said... Uh, hey, can I get this? And, and in my head, I'm like, oh, of course you want this, this hot book. This book is going for $20. You know, how dare you? Then when I say, no, it's too late, they're like, okay, thanks for thanks for uh, uh, letting me know. I appreciate it. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, you're, wel you're welcome. I, as always, our anger and our frustrations are kind of disproportionate to the, the actual amount of interactions. Like, when I think about our subscription service, the people who even use Pullbox are a, a small minority of our subscription service. I would argue that based on what I see as far as regular use, as in at least once a month making changes to their subscription list through Pullbox, I'm going to go ahead and say it's probably 10 to 20% of our subscriber base. Okay. I would say more than 50% of our subscriber base doesn't make any changes whatsoever beyond in-store saying, oh, add this to my list. Sure. Like they don't even email us for stuff. 10 to 20% use Pullbox. Of, of that group, very, very few are people who are doing the last minute, uh, you know, when I say last minute, I mean after FOC, so within a three-week window before the book comes out, making additions to their, their list that are just uh, variant covers, hot books, new printings, that sort of stuff. Um, we have a few people in our subscription service who basically are subscribed to nothing. They yeah. just do last three-week uh ads special orders which is is basically the worst way you could utilize our system as far as we're concerned it is not it is, at all a subscription service yeah it is it is basically just pull this off the shelf for me because we haven't ordered to accommodate you because we can't because the order's already closed um so it's just whatever we thought we we're selling for the rack this person's coming in before we open it, it would be like if we let them in at ten fifty five wednesday morning to get first crack of the new to, release to pick wall. everything they want off the shelves and we would never do that and it's like oh but somehow that's the loophole for a subscription service because we don't have deadlines because we've always been very accommodating because it, stupidly we're thinking about it in the old style where we would get people who are like i didn't even realize this book was coming out i love this character i love these creators please put me down for this and that will always find a way to accommodate. Sure, absolutely. If you're like, I didn't know there was a new Batman miniseries event coming up called Fear State. Please put me down for Fear State Alpha. It's like, well, A, we already did if you're down for Batman. But B, like, fine, we'll figure that out. And but, C, it's been a call out in the weekly newsletter for the last month. So scroll, scroll down past the new books. Yep. But unfortunately, that's a situation that is not how most people are using the system when it comes to last minute things. It's specifically hot books and variant covers that we didn't order or or did order but ordered fewer of because we didn't think anyone was down for it because no one had asked for it before focs or hot, new printings that we ordered low on because again no one had reserved them until the orders closed and then all the reservations came in so that isn't a lot of people that is a few people i mean i could probably count on one hand the amount of people who are really taking advantage of our laissez-faire attitude towards last minute orders so it's not a thing that we need to, like, crack the whip on necessarily to, you know, close everything down on. 
but certainly putting in some guardrails when we have new systems in place is something that we're looking to that I'm specifically looking to do because sure. we need to have a little thing I'm that definitely says looking forward to that. Yeah, you hate it more than I do, but even I don't really like it very much. Um basically things that say, hey, you know, the deadline to pre order anything is the final order cutoff date. And here's Manage Comics that specifically has a tab for final order cutoff. We've already told a few people and it, they've been really good about it. Like there's a few folks that early on in the process, when Pullbox was was running we're switching their covers and doing all the little alterations and stuff kind of at, at the last minute or they were adding variant covers after the orders had closed and we had to go, hey, here's the tab that you look at on Pullbox where the final order cutoffs are. If you want to do that stuff and they did a thing and, and I'm totally fine with this. Like, James, if you're listening to this, I love the way you do it. They basically were down for a bunch of X-Men books and they said, you know, I really want to be able to get the variant covers. Like, X-Men books have a lot of cool artist variants, and sometimes those don't get shown on initial order because Marvel's uh, terrible. Yeah, they're the, jerks and always add things up to the last yeah. second. So they'll just be called artist variant until the week before FOC, and then they're like, here's the artist and here's the cover. I hate how much of the weekly Marvel news that we have to go through, mm -hmm. we mean retailers, yeah. is all X-Men number three artist variant is now going to be drawn by Steve McNiven and can be renamed... X Men number three McNiven variant, right. but it's also there, it's like, like seven of those you know, in a row. Number four of seven or right. X Men number three Stormbringers Bustios variant will now have art by uh, Javier Garon and can be called like right. yeah, it's completely all, different artist. Or how often they they swap out very specific artists mm -hmm. like Scotty Young with someone completely different yeah. after you've already ordered all your Scotty Young covers. Yeah. It was a Scotty Young cover, and now it looks like a Gabriel Del Otto cover. And it's like, oh, those are two completely different styles. The people who wanted the Scotty Young one are not going to be okay with this. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so what James did was he basically realized that he would want to be changing the covers for all of his X-Men books every month. So he deleted all his subscriptions to X-Men titles. And then by FOC, he just goes in and adds whatever covers he wants. Sometimes it's the cover A. He doesn't like the variants. Yeah. But as long as he's doing that by FOC... I'm fine with it because that amounts to a subscription. Is If you want to only do sure. special orders, but you do them all by FOC, that is as good as the person who is like, I just want to sign up for Batman cover A every month, the end. For the record, I'll still complain about it because it is a little, it takes a little bit longer to check everything in. You have to pull sort so it. many different covers. I have to pull, you hate yeah, it. But I, as, I do. As far as like the financial aspect and like the subscription part of it, I'm totally fine with someone doing that. And in fact... Looking at some of the ways Managed Comics does things, like, that's the thing that we're going to have to tell people is, like, look, if you're somebody who wants to switch out covers for your books every month, just order FOC titles. Like, don't even look at the monthly catalog. Yeah. Just look at FOCs, pick the covers you want, that's the end of it. Because Managed Comics is not really doing the thing where, like, oh, I can just switch out my covers every month. Like, you really can't. Like, they're not built for that right now. That so I've seen. what about the people that don't ever mm -hmm. look at that stuff? Mm-hmm. And just email you, like, Monday morning, hey, here's everything else I want for the week. That is the thing that we are also, like, it, Pullbox is a system where it's hard to really press it on people because it doesn't work very well. And it works less well now that Diamond is distributing less publishers. Like, because they have to get... Yeah, they their, have a new one. It's called Marvel PR. Uh -huh, because they have to get their sales data and their, and their solicit data from Lunar and from PRH it takes longer and the stuff isn't really there. Like there, there's a one to two week gap for diamond to have all the DC data for the current catalog. And there's like a week and a half to week gap now for Marvel because they have to get the Marvel data and they have to get it in their system and they're not yeah. getting it at the same time right. as lunar and PRH are getting it. So we pushing pull box is not a thing that we're really doing anymore. We're offering it as an option, but whatever. Uh, managed comics is going to be built into, assuming we go this way, it's going to be built into our point of sale system and our uh, in-store subscription management. So it is kind of, I don't want to say it's non-optional, but it's going to be by default set up for people. So it's going to be a lot easier to tell certain people, hey, again, the cutoff is this day. Go to this site. Here's a link to it. Uh, do this. Instead of every Sunday or Monday before books come out, do this three weeks before every Sunday or Monday. And you're just ordering that stuff, so it's all yeah. ready to go. So that's what we're probably going to be doing with certain people, just to be like, hey, our system changed. It's not really set up to do this as easily anymore. 
please do this instead. Uh, these are kind of our rules now. It's to your benefit. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly to, to the benefit of, of other folks because, you know, if Managed Comics manages to be, no pun intended, uh, pull box but better, the ability to have all that stuff centrally located so that someone can log into it and see all of that and know what they're getting and know all that stuff, you don't need to do it the the Monday before because you know what you're down for and you know what you don't have and you can just do it before the orders close. Like, that's kind of letting people know, like, hey, if you're going to be making changes to your subscription list, understand when the orders close. There's a way to find out every single book that I've seen, I think, on the Managed Comics database tells you when the FOCs are. Like, not only in the, the specific FOC tab, but it'll tell you when the orders close. So you don't have to be worried about, like, is it too early, too late? Like, if it's in the catalog and it doesn't say the FOCs have closed, you can add it to your list. Great. Past that point, you can't. Next time, like, I don't want to say figure it out sooner, but, like, be more aware of the timeline. Uh, here's a fun little comics suite RMH thing from today. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve had asked for the Marvel Blacklight poster book. Yes. And it's a, it's a resolicit. It yep. came out before, but it was canceled. Okay. Pull up his account, double check everything he has on order. It's not there. Go to ordered form. Mm -hmm. It says customer already has this on order. Yep. But it's not in his list anywhere. I don't know if I posted it. Oh, you did it. Yeah, I did it last night. Oh. Remember you, okay. you had said, are you in the system? And yeah, I said, yeah, I'm just yeah. Done. Okay. And then okay. I said, I'll do it. Because <laughs> then I'm like, ah. Uh, so I'm like, well, I'll do it anyway. And then I post. It's like, oh, he's down for two now. Yep. And you can't just change it back to one. Yeah. So I had to delete it yeah, and then, then re -add re -add it. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I just added it, but okay. I, I guess I just didn't post it. That's fine. That's because uh, that, since it was initial order, it didn't seem that. Because I'm like, look, necessary. this this isn't a Marvel nor a DC <laughs> product. Nope. What's the deal? Also, we had somebody. I think it's Abrams. Want to add uh, this upcoming week's Last House on the Lake nice number house. one? Did I say Last House? You did. Keep doing that because that horror movie. It's fine. Last House on the Left, number one, third print. Uh -huh. And I went to add it as a special order. It's not in the system. No. It's because it hasn't been received. Is that why? Yeah. I mean, okay. well, I won't receive anything until Monday. You can't. Uh, you can't receive it Monday. The also, computer's be hooked up. Yeah. I mean, well, that's the thing. Like, normally I would do it Monday. It's going to be Tuesday this week. Yeah. Um, You'll be busy unpacking a cooler. Maybe. And figure out where that goes. Yeah. Um, I hope it fits under one of the front table. I hope so, too. Uh, probably not. It's probably going to have to go where the uh, hand sanitizer station is. Yeah. I mean, well, that's where we, it was going to go. Yeah, we, anyway. we already made up. Uh, anyway, uh, it it's um, it's not in the system because we ordered it directly through Lunar. Like, we didn't order it through the initial order catalog. So oh, it, okay. It won't be sure. in the system. So I just put them in the book. That's fine. Yeah. Ordinarily, you would just, you would do it normally and it would create a new order for Lunar, and then I would just commit that and not send it to them because we already have it on order. Yeah. And then when the book comes in, it would say, hey, this is for them, but in the book is fine since it's this week anyway. There's just so many things now that our default is, let's just write down a piece of paper. Yeah. Which, I got two sheets of paper of graphic <laughs> novels that we ordered that had their orders canceled, but we don't have a way to put them in the system, so... I, so you had to write like, down what it was and who go. wanted it, yeah. To make sure we were ordering it on FLC, because yeah. it wasn't in PRH's system yet, and now that we're ordering it, when it comes in, we have to understand who they're for, because there's... I don't know exactly how to put that in the system in a way where it would understand it. So it was just simpler to just write it down. This week's Lunar FOCs is annoying because it's all DC annuals. No, oh, well, that's okay. Um, yeah, but it's all, you know, it's a special order. There's right. no, it's, it's, it's annoying. I'm sure. And then also one of them is like, it's the Midnighter Annual. Oh, that's not tied to any book. I mean, I know it's the backup in uh, action, Superman or Action, Action, but who's buying Action just for that? Oh, you know? nobody. Yeah. Nobody would care. <laughs> like, that's the thing you order like six copies of? <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, man. And of course, one of the books, the only actual book is uh, Get Joker. Mm -hmm. That came out this week. So it's like, yay, no sales data. Right. Same same old broken record. Yep. Uh, but, Dow, we were going to start this episode by telling uh, fun customer stories. Oh, okay. And by fun, I mean, I hope entertaining to the listener, not to... Let's hope. Mo more like things that we just... Things that perplexed us, shall we say. Right. When the pandemic started, mm -hmm. we started selling things online. Yeah. Through Shopify, who we currently use now. True. Uh, mainly, we have a, a, you know, a curbside pickup option. Mm-hmm. We have three options for 
It used to be four. It used to be delivery, but that's gone. Right. But there used to be... It's, it's shipping or curbside or in-store pickup, which are the same thing, but they're not. Yeah. We have to have two separate entries because of uh, when Shopify instituted local pickup as a shipping option, it doesn't work with a bunch of the... Payment. Like, the easy checkout payment options. Yeah. Like if you choose like Google Pay or PayPal... You can't, it doesn't understand local. It, it only understands shipping. And that's been a thing that I, I, on Shopify's help forums, I started a thread form like, is this how it's working? Because it doesn't seem like how it should work. And Shopify responded by saying, yes, that's how it works. We definitely want it to work for all payment options. We're working on that. That was a year ago. And I still get updates when people post to that forum. Other customers. Pe- yeah, other customers post that thread saying, is this still not working? Uh, so yeah, we had to create a second shipping option that would work with the easy payment stuff called curbside pickup, um, which is a little frustrating because it doesn't include a lot of the fun options of local pickup, where you can tell people an order is ready. You can just push a button and yeah. they'll, they'll get you a notification say, ready saying, for pick pickup, up. and then they get all that stuff. Otherwise, like we have to basically email them separately to say your order is ready. Pretend like we shipped it out. We we click a we click a fulfill button instead of a shipment button, so we don't have to print out a label or anything that they didn't pay for and then email them to say your order's here because otherwise they'd have no way to know they would just get we've had people who get the email who then also get the shopify notification saying your order's been shipped out and they have to go why is my order shipped out and it's like it's not don't worry about it yeah but yeah a year later shopify's like we're working on it okay one of the things that i always forget about the shopify storefront is that people can pay using paypal Mm mm-hmm so whenever I'm trying to reconcile financials, <laughs> I'm like, where is all this money? Oh, right. It doesn't go to it. It goes to a different goes account. To PayPal. Yeah, it doesn't go. It doesn't. It's not tied to a specific store account. Right. It goes to someone else's bank account. No, you can take it out of there and put it in the store's account. But I don't. I mean. I don't, but you could. Okay. I mean, I, I think we you said before that we wanted to use PayPal to save up for an upcoming large expenditure. Should. All that cocaine we're buying for 10? Yeah. No, he buys his own. We're buying it for him as a gift. More cocaine? I guess. What you do you never think a cocaine addict cocaine. wants most in life? Probably more cocaine. More cocaine. Yeah, that's true. I'm assuming. I don't. I don't it know never for sure. goes to waste. I will ask Press Ten Vans mm-hmm. next next time I talk to him. Uh, so anyway. Anyway. Every time somebody buys something, it's it's a separate transaction. It's a cut. It's a separate. Doesn't go to our bank account. Order number. No. A separate order number. Oh yeah. Oh Shopify. Now we're talking about okay. And then we have a whole section behind the counter in the store for people in the store who put something on hold or somebody that has requested something and it comes in we have a, a separate hold area for online orders yep. mainly because Different box. there's too many at one time to fit into one box mm-hmm. for both of them combined and last saturday somebody came in and i had been in the back and i came out and samantha was helping them and she's looking through the hold box and she can't find the book based off of this person's name mm-hmm. and then as i walk up he offers the point he's like oh it's uh order number uh 13 whatever 1311 mm-hmm. and i go right oh and right i go oh that's it's sam that's a shopify order it's in the blue box then i pause and go i'm sorry 13 <laughs> he's like yeah it was from uh september it was a graphic novel ordered and paid for on september 2nd 2020 it was a while ago and they were picking it up it's 11 months ago literally 11 months ago 11 months later they came in for that book that's great it was still there we still had it yeah but come on yeah 11 months later because i'm like 13 11 that can't be right we are you know, like thousands of orders beyond that okay that's an exaggeration but we are a thousand orders beyond that yeah uh i thought that was like and and they're like yeah it, it was a while ago yeah it was but especially then, because there's some people who had orders on hold that long that we eventually emailed to say do you want to come get this should we ship it out what are we doing with yeah. this and so they even got that one and it still took them like another three months to come in yeah every couple of months we're like <laughs> hey don't forget you paid for this there was somebody that paid for it's like bags and boards and just never came to get them never came to get them yeah they're like oh i'm sorry can you ship them to me no we're not shipping you like the sh- the cost to ship you these hundred boards would be twice as much as they cost you to, yeah. to buy. Ridiculous! I, I can't believe it was an entire, uh, almost an entire eleven year. months. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we let. Don't get me wrong. We still have 
two boxes of Glow Comics that <laughs> Not for long. hundreds of people prepaid for to be able to be part of the uh, April Mendez, Amy, Amy Garcia. Garcia signing we had that to get in you had to prepay for all four all four issues yep. and they just because they we never... knew people weren't going to come back for two three and four and it was like all right well we're going to make sure you pay for them in advance yeah and they still didn't come back for them. no and, and that we're... was the joke is like they basically were like i am fine paying 20 bucks to meet uh april mendez and amy garcia yeah we're coming up on two years for that oh now. They're, they're, yeah they're not gonna oh no i know i know yep they are not going to make it the full two years. But just the, <laughs> the sheer, so many people. Yeah, a lot. I mean, the majority, the vast majority. Vast majority, yeah. Which, honestly, if we ever have like a celebrity signing, we're doing that again? Because it's not worth the money to, to order super high in issue one and hope they come back for two because no. they're never going to. No, do you know what we do next time? We just charge 20 bucks and be done with it. Yeah, that's fair. Like, yeah. we always try to be fair about it of like, oh, well, we'll, you know... The uh, the CM Punk signing, you got to buy a Thor comic for five bucks. Yeah. And then people, you know, basically could not have cared less about the Thor comic they were getting. They didn't want to get it signed or they, some of them didn't even want to take it. It was just like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, this is an event for the, the book yeah. that he wrote. He's here you literally to don't promote care. this book he wrote. That is a thing that you have zero interest in. And it's just, it was unfortunately the same thing with the April and Amy thing where it's like, oh, they're writing this cool glow comic. Like... Here is, like, uh, a TV person and a wrestling person, and they're writing a comic about a, a TV, TV show program? about wrestling. Yeah. It's really fun, and it was just, like, I would say 85% or more did not pick up issues 2, 3, and 4. Like, a lot. So it's like, we still ordered the comics for you. Like, that was substantially less profit we made on the event. Yeah. Because we have all these books that we bought, and someone paid for it, but it's like, I could have made... You know what, like six bucks more a person, sure, per person for the a lot of people who showed up for that event. Uh, that's that's a lot of money that I pissed away for those books that people ended up not coming to pick up, and then also just storing them for two years, yeah. Which again, it will not be the full two years, promise you that, yeah, that's for sure. So, yeah, I mean, it would have been better to just say, like, look, I, let's just charge people ten bucks, they get a book, we're done, fine with that, yeah. Although, I mean. I'm not fine with that because I want them to read the book. <laughs> right. We we're, we're and we're not trying to make money off of a celebrity. No. We're trying to promote their work and further the reach of their written word. Yeah. And but drawn, I mean, you, you drawn can't make picture. people care about stuff. The written word, the drawn picture. I'm just adding the drawn picture. It's nice into it because it makes sense, right? It you does. Talk really about the written word. Yeah. I mean, the art's great on that. But yeah, it's it's super frustrating to do events like that where it's like. This person who's known for thing A is doing thing B, so we're going to sell thing B. And it's like they literally only care about thing A. They don't nope, care about thing, thing B at all. Just thing A. And that's super frustrating. And it's a thing that we keep stupidly assuming that we can change. And that is a thing that we will stop assuming we can change going forward. Yeah. Honestly, there's so many things that we've been shouting into the wind about yeah. that we're just going to have to give up on. Yeah. And I mean, like, to be clear, like, I also feel bad for the creators. Like... Amy and April did an amazing job on that series. Good enough to get other books that they do not have a connection to. I mean, they did a D&D &D series, and those aren't two creators that I think of as D&D &D people. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, they don't, they're not streaming. They're not playing <laughs> like regularly, again, as far as again, I know. Glow is a, a TV show about wrestling, and so they got a, a TV person and a wrestling person to do it, and that makes perfect sense. But, you know, D&D &D they got off of the, the merits of the actual story they wrote for the Glow comic book. And now they each have stories in different issues of Wonder Woman, Black, White, and Gold. Yeah. And so there, it, it's not just like a vanity project thing. These are talented creators that you would think, uh, if you're a fan of, of, you know, their online persona or their work in a similar field, like, you know, April's written books, you know, she wrote a book. Yeah. I assume a lot of people who were showing up to the event read her book that was like, I assume did really well because I, I feel like I saw it a bunch of places. It got covered a bunch of places. Uh, yeah, we you, were having... We, you would we like the Glow comic then. <laughs> yeah. So, Crazy yeah, is My Superpower is the name of the book. It is. It's frustrating to With see... With art by Choose Rob Guillory. A fan base... With art by Farmhands Rob Guillory. That is both incredibly loyal to them, but also only to a certain degree. 
that's why we really don't go out of our way to do non-comic signings. Like, we get requests for, say, Power Ranger people sure. often. And yeah, I know there's Power Ranger comics and it ties in, but that person isn't promoting a comic that we could point to, you know? Right. right. Uh, we make exceptions for wrestlers because we're wrestling fans. Yeah. And if, you know, Jimmy Hart wants to come to the store, I want Jimmy Hart in the store. Yeah, and sometimes it's a thing where, like, a local promotion is putting it on. Yeah, and so we can help them promote an event they're doing. Right. It, it feels like a community good more than just, like... We have turned make... down... Oh, hey, do you want this random wrestler just to sign in your store for no reason? Like, I don't think anybody would come out to see Greg the Hammer Valentine. <laughs> no no offense to Greg the Hammer Valentine. He's a he's a Hall of Famer or mm -hmm. a future Hall of Famer or something. He's... But he's no Jim the Anvil Lightheart. Definitely not. No. Nobody is anymore. No. So, yeah, like, we'll, uh, if, if it makes sense for us. Yeah. And I'm not saying we don't do celebrity signings, but. But, yeah, I mean, certainly, like, the ideal scenario is, you know, a celebrity's fan, a celebrity's fans come out to an event that they're doing about a comic book and they, you know, are getting the comic because they're a fan of that celebrity and then they read the comic and they enjoy it and they want more of it. That would be like if we could get. Justin Roiland, but he would only be signing Orcs in Space or Trover Saves Universe. Sure. And that's all. Yeah. Like, People I, would not want that. I mean, when we had a, a signing with Charles Montgomery Punk, it was specifically for the comic he wrote. It wasn't just like, let's just have a signing with Punk because he's an incredibly popular wrestler slash UFC fighter slash dog owner. Let's do it because he's writing a comic book. And that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Uh, all right, Dalna, you have a customer interaction story. I do. And yours involves Set it up for me. <laughs> Department of Truth, Volume 1. Oh, I do, yes. I remember that now. A <laughs> uh, gentleman comes into the store, first time in, and, and asks uh, if we carry a series called uh, Department of Truth. And I say we do. I ask him if he'd want to be shown the single issues on the shelf or if he'd rather be seen, shown the graphic novel. He says the graphic novel. So I take him over to the front table where we have a display of Department of Truth, Volume 1. I hand him a copy of the book, and I say, yeah, this is the, the first collection. He's like, yeah, a friend told me about it. Um, it sounds really good. Is it is it good? Do you like it? And now, let me say for the listeners, I don't read Department of Truth anymore. I tried the first issue. It wasn't for me. But I recognize that it's a book that has a lot of acclaim behind it. Patrick, in particular, really enjoys it. Really enjoy it. It's, we, they just finished their uh, heartbreaking two-issue Bigfoot story. So I said to this person... So good. Uh, it's, it's really popular. A lot of people really love it. it. If you like urban legends and stuff like X-Files, you'll really enjoy it. And uh, they go, how much is it? And I flip the book over, and it says on the back, it's ten dollars. It's one of the nine ninety nine image first volumes. Yeah, one of those You're, introductory it ones. It collects six issues of a comic. Yeah. What would normally be like sixteen to seventeen dollars for ten dollars. Ten dollars. The biggest deal, the biggest regular deal in comics, aside from mm -hmm. sales yep. or twenty five cent yep. issues. And if you can tell by Patrick's tone, uh, you can probably guess where the rest of the story goes. Uh, guy goes, $10. What, what tone? I was just, this is my normal voice. This is how I talk all the time. Guy goes, $10. Yeah, you know, uh, I, well, I, I tell you what, um, I think I'm going to check online to see if I, and then he realizes that he's about to tell me, the person in the store, that he's going to check online to see if he can find it for a cheaper price, and sort of pulls himself up short and tries to figure out what the rest of that sentence could possibly be. Uh, if I, uh, you know, just, uh, take a look and, uh, yeah, but I'll definitely be back. Uh, I'll definitely be back to get it. You definitely will not be yeah, back. Yeah, I'm like, uh-huh, okay, great. And, uh, when I told Patrick this story later, he had basically the same tone he had on the recording here, where he could not believe that someone, when, when they were faced with a $10 price tag for a thing they could get right then and leave the store with it, was like, where is he going to get a better deal? How much does he want to save? I mean, I'm sure you can. I'm sure there's plenty of uh, discount clubs or, you know, DCBS. Let's check and see what Amazon's on it. Um, but even DCBS, you're not going to get, like, free shipping. And it's going to take a while to show up. Oh, only if you, if you buy a lot more stuff, sure, you will. I, the guy who only came in because he wanted Department of Truth is going to suddenly find a bunch of other graphic novels to get a DCBS and be okay with waiting that long? Yeah, he'll, sure. he, he'll, he'll browse online sure. rather than browse in the store. At least my story about the guy who came in 11 months later to get his prepaid uh, Batman Turtles graphic novel uh -huh. still spent like 85 more dollars on stuff around the store. Sure. Uh, Department of Truth Volume 1, The End of the World, uh, is currently uh, at nine ninety nine on uh, Amazon, but it also says save 150 at checkout. I don't know what that means. Hmm. 
I don't know how you save 150. Do you want to do you want to look at it on DCBS just for funsies? Details. Let's go to details real quick. I guess you just get a buck fifty back or something. So yeah, I mean, it, this dude could have had it in hand, but even with Amazon Prime, like he's gonna get it in like uh, a day. He'll get it in a day. Yeah, a day or two. Like I, if I ordered it today on Friday, I, they're promising I'd get it on Monday. Okay. And you save a buck fifty. Like, is that worth it? Yeah. Like, is is the buck fifty that difficult to to justify? Check DCBS. Sure. While you're doing that, I'll start my next story. Please do. Uh, We often offer, that's a a fun little tongue twister. It really is. People, a money back guarantee on books we personally recommend. Every once in a while, a couple times a year, we'll have a a display, a counter dump at the front counter for a book that we love. For example, most recently it was Six Sidekicks, I believe. Mm -hmm. It's a, or your money back is what the sign says. Right. And if you don't like the first issue, you 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 can get your money back, no questions asked asked now we don't do that for anything else but we will give you an offer for a trade we recommend if you don't like it we'll let you swap it out for something else we won't give you your money back but we'll let you swap it out for something else and that's just for trades we personally recommend it's not anything we have posted it's not something we tell everybody but if you are on the fence on a book and we say no buy it you'll like it that's on us you know, you shouldn't be held accountable, or held responsible for us telling you to buy a book. Mm. But that's only if we give you that offer. If you just say, hey, I like book, like horror, what should I get? And we list like seven horror books in the horror section. We're not recommending those. We're just giving you advice on other books we carry. Can I jump in with a quick... You certainly can. You should have told me to go to in-stock trades, which was where I wanted to go. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Department of Truth Volume. I just didn't want to publicize that, Dal, on the podcast. Department of Truth Volume One. I'll just publicize this part. It's currently forty-two percent off at InStockTrades.com. Forty-two um, percent, which is five seventy-nine for the cover price with four dollars shipping. <laughs> but if if they do add forty-four dollars and twenty-one cents worth of stuff, they could get free shipping. Okay. But I don't know how slow that free shipping is. Fair enough. Uh, well, so if... yeah, nine seventy-nine. I don't, I don't know if there's tax or not. I assume there probably is. It depends on what state you're in, I guess. So twenty cents. They could have saved twenty cents. There you go. If they got us your stock trades rather than just buy it in the store. So if we recommend a book you've never heard of, let's say you Time like demands. horror and I pitch Infidel, you've never heard of Infidel or Porn Shag, Pichotto, and you take a chance on it, yeah, we'll give you a money back guarantee. Or and you know, we'll, we'll give the option to I always say, exchange it. I always say you can exchange it for another book. Yeah. Basically, like, yeah. if, if you come in and you say, I don't know what I want from sci-fi fantasy, and I go, Kaiju Max, and I pitch on Kaiju Max, and you buy Kaiju Max, and you don't like Kaiju Max because... It's too cutesy for a, you. A, Kaiju murdered your family, and you didn't make that connection until you got home, um, which you'd probably enjoy the book more because they're all in prison. And you bring it back, you know, I'll just... You can browse the store, find something else, and then I will take the, the Kaiju Max sale off of your transaction so if it's it needs to be the same price as the graphic novel or more more. yeah so if it it doesn't have to be like a straight exchange and it's not going to be a store credit is literally just go find something else right now (laughs) to get instead and obviously people's tastes are different not everybody likes the same thing and if everybody does like the same thing that thing has to be so watered down that it appeals to everybody you know it it has to it has to be lesser than to for to reach everybody i suppose so when somebody came in last saturday and they had a book they wanted to return because they just didn't like it and that book was saga something broke inside of me yeah i mean i was gonna say like when you're telling that story and you're saying like it's got to be so like homogenous all i'm thinking is like no saga (laughs) like saga is really good and really specific and unique and yet everybody loves it clearly not yeah Right? Incorrect. So uh, they're like, yeah, I can, can I get something else for it? I'm like, yeah, of course. And then they said, can you recommend something else? And I said, no. No. You didn't like literally the best book we have. I can't give you something else. But mainly I did that because I didn't want, like, the money back offer. The, the, I'm sorry, the, you know, the, ex- the exchangeable offer yeah. is not a recurring thing. No, that's not a constant thing. That is basically like... When you come in, if you don't know what you want, and we make a recommendation, and you take us up on that recommendation, if you don't like it, you can bring it back. If you bring it back, we're done recommending things. Yep. 
Like, I don't feel like I want to put myself in the position where I'm constantly recommending stuff you don't like, because clearly I don't have a read on what you're going to like. Uh, that's first and foremost. And secondly, yeah, I don't feel like I want to keep recommending books that you then bring back and have to get a different book in exchange. Like, I, like, I will keep recommending stuff with a uh, free exchange offer on subsequent visits as long as you don't bring something back. Yeah, oh, exactly. The exactly. second you bring something back... You it's are like, on right, your own. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that, and, is, that is the trade-off for being able to getting the option of trading the book back in. I, I can't help you anymore. I do feel like I had to rent it back in because uh, and I even said, I'm like, hey, it's it's totally fine. You didn't like it. I, people have different tastes. And I will show you other things in different areas, but I'm not, quote-unquote, recommending them anymore. Mm-hmm. And they had said, well, I, I liked, because they also bought Oblivion Song mm-hmm. by uh, Robert Kirkman. Mm-hmm. And they said, but I, I liked that one. <laughs> okay. All right. So well, that's somewhere to, to direct you. Sure. But nothing else is recommended more along the line, more pointed out. Right. More referenced. Yeah. Not quote unquote recommended. I will give you options. I will answer questions. Yeah. I'm not going to recommend anything. Yeah. So, I mean, I... Didn't mean to be super judgy, but it definitely came off judgy. Probably. With the, literally, can you recommend something else? No. <laughs> I can't. I can tell you things, but I cannot recommend them. Uh, Dan, I'm real far behind in uh, PDF pre- previews and things. Okay. Have you read anything? I... Like, I really want to get to Destroy All Monsters, but I haven't even done the uh, second Reckless book, so... Yeah, I haven't. Friend of the Devil, I haven't done that one yet. I haven't done the first one yet. That's right. Uh, I did read the first chapter of Friday, though. Friday's great. Friday's real good. Yeah, I I actually uh, bought Friday on Panel Syndicate. I didn't. And, like, I guess that worked out for me because Image was like, do you want to read three issues of Friday? And I went, I'll read at least the first one. And I did, and it was really good. (laughs) Friday is the new Ed Brubaker, Marcos Martin series that is... Incredibly creepy. Yeah. It's it's hard to say it's a horror series in chapter one, because it's more just like small town mystery. Yeah, like I mean the gimmick like of it grown up Encyclopedia Brown almost. Well, and then that's not, sort of the gimmick is that like the girl who was like the Watson to that town's Encyclopedia Brown has now gone away to college. She's coming back for the first like winter break, and before she left, things got really weird between her and Encyclopedia Brown, and she comes back to this town, and it's this mix of. Like, definitely, like, a weird kind of Lovecraftian vibe where there's something in this town and it doesn't make sense. But it's also, like, the metaphor of when you go away to college and when you leave your hometown and you come back and it's just, like, it doesn't fit you anymore and you don't know what changed. Did Was the town always like this or did you change somehow? So it's working with that metaphor in a really fun way. But it's also uh, Marcos Martin doing the art. Uh, like, I mean... And, and this, Private Eyes Marcus Martin. And this is a, a shortcoming on, on me because I can never remember the name of the colorist. Because Marcus Martin, Marcus Martin, and uh, uh, yeah. I believe his wife. Okay. It's his wife yeah. who does the colors. But together, their art is what sells it. Yeah, for and sure. And we're focusing on him because he's the well-known name. But it's the two of them together who have formed this uh, artistic... I'm going to look it up, and then I'm going to duo. say a name from another country that I'm probably going to do a bad job with, but yeah, I won't do it anyway. Yeah, and wasn't there a, uh, a name that... Wait, we... I'm, I'm sure Martin is even right. <laughs> but it's Martin. Right. Uh, there was somebody, and I can't remember if I mentioned this, but I can't remember who it is now either, so it's a hard thing to bring up. I'm mainly doing it to kill time as you're looking this up. Thanks. But there was, a, there was somebody's name... Oh, and now I forget it. Uh, Mikkel... Yeah. Oh, Mianon? Well, that's what we said, but it's not. It's a... Uh, I, fr- I, I, mm, I, I told you about it, and you said, like, I'm not going to remember that. Munsa Vincente. No, it's it's not. That's not, not how you pronounce. No? Yannin. Really? Okay. Yeah. Is it Yannin? It's not... No, because we would, we would say um, Mikhail Yannin, but it's it's like a it's like Hannon. It's like a H sound. Mikhail Hannon? Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, so... Munsa Vincente. Say it again, because what without me talking over it? Munsa Vicente is the color artist on Vi- Friday. Vicente, v- like it's tough because it's not, it's not. It's, it's not, not Vincente. Not Vincente. Yeah, Vicente. No, I'm saying it's not Vincente because that's Vicente. what you. It was Italian. You'd think, oh, it's Vic- Vincente. That's the thing. Vincente. My mouth keeps wanting to do Vincente. I keep wanting to put a second N in it, Should've but it doesn't. Should pour that so close to the microphone. 
It's just the one N. V I C E N T E. Vicente. 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 But I, Vicente. my my mouth. I can't. I can't get that. Vich. Like I can't get Vicente. that. But I, every time I say the whole word, Vicente. Like my mouth. I can. I can feel my tongue making that N sound on the roof of my mouth, and having to stop it. I can't. Anyway. Robert Burns and I got into a very loud argument over the way I pronounce the words year and hear. Year and hear? Yes. Apparently I do it very Midwesternly. Well, Robert Burns, who Robert Burns texted earlier. From Hinsdale, Illinois. <laughs> texted <laughs> earlier in this podcast. your Midwestern accent. Got to it. To say he only listens to one podcast, and that's Challengers. He loves us guys, which is pretty much the same message he did like two weeks ago he just wants it and also on the podcast it's not challengers it's it's contest of challengers that's the podcast he's not a real fan but yes he basically he says that i say year and here instead of your and her year and here anyway yeah. uh I, again i was just uh, friday is real good yeah uh it yeah just a very fun i only read the first chapter because i'm like i want to read the rest of this in a book it's um, it's a it's three chapter good. book. Yeah, which it's is three why they issues, gave yeah. the three the three comics because it's like but here's the whole book. They're oversized. It's not like single issues. They're oversized. Uh, I feel like I read something else recently, a PDF that was given to us by a publisher, but I genuinely cannot recall which one it was. Uh, I think I liked it though. For whatever that's I can't, I keep meaning to read Eat the Rich, but I haven't gotten around to it. I did read Eat the Rich. I didn't like it very much. Okay, well. it did um, not work for me. There is, I know there's more things that I read. I read Lucky Devil, but that's out now. Right, and. Uh, I like to find. It's a color Cullen Bunn horror book. Sure. I was talking to a salesperson at a publisher who was relaying a story where one of their retailer clients had said, you know what you guys need? You guys need a horror book written by Cullen Bunn, and that would do great for you. That would really raise your profile. Mm -hmm. And this publisher has a horror book yep. written by Colin Bond. Yep. And and it recently debuted. And I just thought, like, man, uh -huh. retailers, some retailers love to give advice when they don't know who the who they're talking to, yeah. really. Uh, I was talking to a creator today who would called to find advice about uh, how they're going to be putting out a single-issue comic that they're doing, that they it's a really personal book to them, and they really want to... Um, make a big deal out of it, and they 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 are going to go to Kickstarter to to be able to afford the printing of it, mm -hmm. which you know is what a lot of people do in this day and age. Sure. And they wanted to know how to make it. Uh, what's a value add to retailers to help promote this book? Not just like, hey, can I be on your podcast? But it's, hey, can I be on your podcast? But what can I do for you to make it worthwhile to have me on your podcast? Mm -hmm. Not just a as they put it, I don't want to just be taking. Right. I want to be giving as well. Sure. And they had some good ideas of their own. Okay. And I think a lot of their ideas may not be cost effective for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I specifically told them I would ask you your, your advice as well. So I'll ask you about oh, that later. Oh, man. Okay. Well, I mean, not now. Not yeah. Now. Um, I'm very um, skeptical about uh, Kickstarter stuff. Mostly well, because so we, we get a lot of requests, like a lot of stores do. Of like, hey, I've got this thing that's going on Kickstarter. We've got retailer levels. Yeah, okay. Let, let people I, know. Let me just jump in right there. Mm -hmm. the, they're not looking for us to... Like, basically, they want to be able to get people invested in the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And they want to reach a fan base. They're not looking at retailers to buy the book. No, I get that. Because they're going to yeah. print the book and then sell it to retailers later. Sure. No, I, I get all that. Okay. I, mean, I was just saying... Well, like, I just Because that's... 90% that's, of the time, that is not how... Uh, people approach their Kickstarter. Right, right. And so I was just kind of giving people more of the layout of like, this is what we traditionally deal with. Yeah. And we traditionally deal with people who are like, I have retailer levels or I don't have retail levels, but if you could promote my Kickstarter anyway, that would be great. And those are things where it's like, we stopped doing retail levels because we have to buy more copies than we could usually ever sell for a Kickstarter project. And we learned that the hard way. We did. There were a bunch of things we, we supported because we're like, we can sell six copies of that. And that's like, we sold two. Now what do we do with the rest of these? Yeah. I remember a friend of a creator that we had done a Kickstarter or we had gotten like retailer copies from was in the store and was like, I can't believe you still have this. Like we've had those forever. And, and they went, you should tell so-and-so they probably need them. <laughs> or again, it's like promote my Kickstarter for my comic book. And it's like, if we're not even going to carry it, why am I doing that? Why right. am I promoting it? Right. Like I have a very narrow 
band of people I can promote things to. And if it's, if it's going to be something where it's not even related to my business or something that I have a personal stake in or a financial stake in or, or for a friend of the store, if it's a total stranger, why am I doing that? Right. I'm not that good a person. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, outside of that, like, how do you symbiotically help a creator? Like, what is the thing that they can do this, but they can also be of value to you as a store? And I mean, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that right now. Obviously, it would help if I knew who the creator was, but that's something we'll discuss off the air. Uh, a, you should, because I told you that they said hello when we were FaceTiming earlier about the TV. That's right. B, uh, their offer was just free books. Like, I will give you this many copies of that book. That's a good offer. And I thought, how's that cost effective for you? But one of the things... If they that, look at it as, like, media sure. advertising, but one of the things time. that they came up with doing is uh, social media takeover. Like, they handle the Challenger's Instagram page for a day. No, it's and, okay. No, I'm like, you can do that. So long as it's not entirely just about your thing. Like, okay. I'm, like, a thing about social media, and this is something that David Harper uh, put into context, and it's something that I understand but haven't learned, mm -hmm. is that social media is a conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not Fire a monologue. And yeah. And I treat social media as a monologue. You do, it's true. Yeah. So uh, if somebody else can do something that has a better take on it under our guys, when it's somebody that we like. Yeah, I mean, I, I think some of the best successes we've had with like social media stuff was uh, back when the Rogues Gallery was going. Yeah. And we had an intern that was like, when would we uh, do... I prefer docent. Okay, docent. Or cheesemonger. Well, I mean, she was an intern and her job as an intern was a docent. That's <laughs> so fair. Both are accurate. But she would be doing these, like, daily quizzes on, like, Facebook and stuff about an artist. Or just, like, polls and things. Yeah, yeah so just... it was very interactive. It wasn't just, like, we have a show coming up. It was, let's get people involved today about this artist, and then hopefully they come in Hey, in who's your weeks. favorite G.I. Joe when we're having Robert Atkins? Right, that's Things like that. So, yeah. like, that's something that, that somebody who is more social media savvy, and it's more, like, natural for them to exist in that world would need to do. I hate it, and my skin would probably literally boil off. Yeah. Um, and you are not as willing to be uh, that interactive. At attentive to it. Yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. You'll have like a, a joke or a thing you want to promote or whatever, and you'll do that. Like, it'll be very like, I have a thought, I want to share it, instead of like being neck deep in it. Well, constantly. The, a, there's a reason we turned off message Facebook messaging from the store mm -hmm. account, and B, if people want that interaction, come to the store. Sure. But that, I'm just saying, like, if you want yeah, no, to have, I know, like, I know. A, a social media presence, that's what having a social uh, media I was talking to a, an adult today who is someone very close to my age who was saying things like, oh, yeah, I found this TikToker who does this. And just this say TikTok Chris Jericho. Jericho. I know it's him. And I just thought, why are you on TikTok? That is weird. It's not for you. No. But, but it is. It's for anybody. But it's like... No. I, <laughs> that, Incorrect. That is a thing that, like, we... We had a TikTok account back when we had Blue. We op we started uh, Sam started showed me how to start a TikTok account, okay. and I set it up. Then I never use it. But the next time I went on, it was gone. Uh huh. Like oh, I guess it just deactivates from not lack of use. But yeah, I don't. I I mean, I know people love it, but I just don't have the time or the or the. Um, but like, I that's... want to say bandwidth, but I don't mean actual bandwidth. You mean interest? Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I... I'm sure there's things that are great. There's plenty of other things that are great in my life that I don't have enough time for. Yeah, I. Yet I'm giving it all to you. I, I don't right now. I don't think it's necessary to, as a comp, as one comic book store in Chicago, Illinois, be omnipresent on social media. Like, it's fine not to. You you got a Twitter, you got a Facebook, you got an Instagram. I don't know, man. Like that's fine. That seems like more than enough. I don't think we need to be on Snapchat, or TikTok. Or what else is even out there? What am I forgetting about? Foursquare? Is Foursquare still around? The YouTube. Uh, we don't need a YouTube channel. We don't need... Well, we do have a YouTube channel. This is but, on there. But we don't week. need one. Do you know what sure. I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, all that stuff, I don't... To do something like that, where you have less than 100 people who would even notice or care, like, why bother? Agreed. Like, we're, we're not Netflix. We're not Rihanna. Like, we don't need... Vast social media reach. 
We're okay. We're one comic shop in Chicago. Rihanna's very rich, by oh, the way, which is why I brought her name up. Uh, it's, she's it's, a billionaire now. In the news. Yeah. And, like, a lot of billionaire musicians, not because of her music. Nope, not because of her music. <laughs> nope. nope. Uh, what we've always wanted to be is the comic store for our community. Sure. I like people coming in and talking to us. Yeah, we it's like nice. it so much that we have such a massive week ahead of us. Oh, golly. To make the shopping experience for your your average challenger's customer that much better mm-hmm. and it'll be uh it it won't be over by the time we're recording next week's episode but it'll be no. majority over yeah so, there'll be one last thing that we have to do this week alone we have tomorrow night not tomorrow night nope. the tomorrow night we have uh, uh a big meeting for the future of business dinner challengers and Sunday night, after we close, we have to empty the entire main floor of the store, get everything off the floor. Yep. So 8 a.m. Monday morning, we can be back there for new carpet and new molding installation. Mm-hmm. Not molding, per se, as in wood, but as in vinyl. Yeah. And then Monday night, we have to bring everything back and reset up the store as if nothing ever happened. So by Tuesday morning, nobody could tell that it was anything different except there'll be... That fresh new carpet yeah. smell. And either late Monday or early Tuesday, uh, Dell will have to do everything he normally would have done on Monday, but yep. couldn't because yep. the store is basically packed up. And then Tuesday, we're getting a Coke delivery of a, of a, a fridge. Some point during this week, we're getting a pallet of 72 cases of Coke. Jesus. Don't know when. No idea when that's happening. No. Possibly Please this be Thursday. Possibly this Thursday, be Thursday. is uh, all new vinyl banners to the middle windows, which uh-huh. we talked about last week. Yep. Also, Thursday is the day that we need to restock a lot of supplies uh-huh. and get all of the gear we need for free comic book day out of storage. Uh-huh. All the shelving and fixtures and stuff. And then Friday we will be building the cage uh-huh. and starting to set up everything for free comic book day and then uh 9 a.m saturday well that'll be we'll talk about that next podcast okay that just gets this is just getting us to the next podcast okay well i was gonna say because like when we record the next podcast free comic book day would still be a day later a day later but But have already happened yeah already happened by the time the podcast so this is the last time to really promote it correct yeah so it's free comic book day masks are 100 percent required we had uh uh, a couple of non-maskers today. One, it was a club member, and I didn't even realize until they were leaving because they just came to the counter, and got their books, and left. Right. And I didn't realize until they were leaving. Like, ah, oh, they didn't. They didn't have a mask on. Uh, and Gina's like, I, I caught it right away, but I thought you were letting them get away with it. <laughs> like I didn't. I didn't realize Did it. Not mean to let anyone get um, away. The while we do have some masks behind the counter, uh-huh. we don't have a ton. No. And I'm not giving them out if I don't like your attitude. <laughs> sure. Okay. So, also, it's been a week that we've been requiring masks in the store again. Uh-huh. And again, this is not our choice. This nope. is... City guidance. City guidance. Yeah, there we go. So, when somebody comes in, like, hey, do you got a mask? No, you got one, right? Can I get one? No, we don't. Yeah, no. And so, when they just go back to their car to get one, it's like, man, you had one. You just didn't want to make the walk. Yeah, and your Great. car was right out front. We should probably get some more masks. Uh, oh, why? Like this week. I just feel like we should. Like, if we can get some at a store, like, cheap? Um, okay. A, we're not going to. Okay. We have an entire other bundle on the back somewhere. Okay. But also, yeah, I like, remember we were going to sell these in the beginning? We were, and it was, like, a buck, but then it was just, like, especially at the time we weren't doing it, because it's like, I, I have to get the money from you, and then I give you the mask, but now I'm interacting with you without a mask, yeah. which is the exact opposite of what I want to be happening. Also, I don't like giving masks to people that then take a, a lap and then leave the store well and that's that's more than fair like i from my experience most people who we've given a mask to have ended up most things. not all exactly i mean i'm not saying like it's a hundred percent adoption rate but in general it's been worthwhile but i mean if you want to be more choosy about who we give it to that's fine well you know we only work together two days a week so yeah <laughs> you only have very, the experience very little overlap yeah yep uh yeah uh free comic book day will be open from 10 till 5 so that's just one hour extra extra on a Saturday. But we'll have to get Tim there. Tim Seeley will be there at 11, and that's all we know for sure. A limit of five books 
up to five books. You don't have to take five. You can take you, less. You can't take more than five. Uh, and we're not going to be handing out any books online early this time. Right. Uh, and as of, I'm going to guess, one o'clock, please don't ask us about House of Slaughter or, or Stray, Stray Dogs. Dogs. They yeah. are probably gone. Or Red Room. Or Red Room. Yep. And at... Uh, I, love, I love that we ordered these books so far in advance. And in between when we ordered them and the release date, Stray Dogs has become like the hottest book in the country. Yeah. Not when we were pushing it, when we were ordering a ton of copies of issue one, but like after issue five came out, it became the hottest book in the country. I don't get it. I'm glad for those creators. Sure. There's very few books that deserve it as much as Stray Dogs did, which is why we were so behind it from the start. But it is this weird thing of like, where were you all when this book was coming out? Yeah. And we had to hand sell it. Um, I listened to an off-panel podcast this week with David Harper mm -hmm. from Sketch.com. And his guest was the guy behind the Key Collector app. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubting that guy's passion for comics. And he's a huge comics fan. But the way he talks about what he expects from his app and how he looks at it is vastly different from how the users look at it. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that I just, that he's saying the right things, but I don't believe them. Yeah, I, there's certainly an element of, you know, it, it's just a tool. I can't control how people use it. And it's like, I don't sell comics. I'm not doing but, this because I don't sell comics. But when you see it, like, it's, it's like Facebook. When you see it doing these things, there's got to be a point where you're like, I know what I created it for. This is what the world turned it into. How much responsibility do I bear for that? It's like our subscription service, like earlier this episode. Maybe. So long story yeah. short, like I, I thought of that because of Stray Dogs. And Stray Dogs is an excellent book. It's really good. And I wish people cared about the insides as much as they yeah, care about the very covers. The vast majority <laughs> of our subscribers who get it from us want it because it's good. Yeah. The vast majority of people that are going to want the free comic day book want it because it's going to be worth money. Yeah. And a lot of all these, like, earlier printings of these books are, these books, like, some of the issues have gone to fifth printing. Yeah. Which is great for them. Sure. But uh, it is definitely a spec-heavy book, and that is why people want it for Free Comic Book Day. Yeah. Same thing And I'm House disappointed because it's a brand new story. Yeah. House of Slaughter is a neat issue because it is literally an issue of Somebody's Somebody Killing the Children, but from the other side. Okay. So it's all new stuff, but it's not. It's like that Buffy Angel phone call. Oh, sure. Okay. But yeah, much longer. It's yeah. literally a phone call. Okay. But, I mean, not the whole thing, but uh, actually maybe I haven't read it. So they're both new new stories. I don't know if Red Room is a, a new story or just a, like a preview or something. I mean, it's probably at least some new content or people yeah. wouldn't care as much. Like the actual reprint books for Free Comic Book Day... Nobody ever cares. Nobody for. ever cares about it. as far as you know speculation. Right. I mean, they like people enjoy reading the comics. I hope, um, but yeah, certainly not as valuable. I remember that being a thing. I, I want to say it was the um, the Archaea, uh, the Mouse Guard. Like oh yeah, like the a little hardcover. Hard yeah, that was the first year for Free Comic Book Day where suddenly it was like, oh, this is going for money online. Yeah, and it was like, it's a free comic book. Why would it be worth anything? And then every year since then, there's been at least one book where it's like, people want it in advance, people are camping out for it, that sort of stuff. It's fun to see the market do that. I was reading a um, an article on Vox, I think, about the boom in sports card collectibles. Yeah. Um, specifically how a lot of it is uh, YouTubers getting boxes of cards and then opening packs. There's a guy who actually does a thing where you can reserve... For like 150 bucks, a pack in a box. So after he opens it, like you'll know what you're getting, and then he sends them out in the mail. And like if it's a huge card, maybe you'll. But a lot of times, like that was worth four dollars, and that guy made 150 bucks on it wow. on top of whatever ad revenue he's making from this Jeez. highly watched video. And like this is like an 18 year old kid who has like office space now because yep. like in the last 15 months, like he's turned opening packs of sports cards into like the last career he'll ever have to have. And that's on top of the people who've been doing it with, like, Pokemon cards and other stuff. Yep. And how, like, that aspect of, of collectibles has just... All of it, it's just skyrocketed. And it's... It was yeah, weird reading... you had the full collection of that run, 
that baseball card series, and you did a YouTube video of you showing off, like, here's everybody from this team. Uh-huh. Nobody would care. Nobody. No, it's it's the opening it's, the packs. Yeah, That's yeah, it's, the part it's, of it. Like, someone figured that out pretty early on. Like, the thrill is watching someone opening a pack, and maybe they get a good card, and it's, like, living vicariously through them. But it was so weird reading this article because it's it's focused purely on sports cards with a little bit of Pokemon stuff to just be like, this is not unique to, to sports cards. Um, but all I'm reading is like, oh man, this is comic book collecting. This yeah. is people who are just, so many people who are solely focused on the value aspect. And like the last few paragraphs of this article are, what about the kids that these like Pokemon cards and sports cards were originally for? Like the market is leaving them behind and creating something where it's only about escalating value. And you see that with comics where it's just, you know, issue one's selling out and going for huge money online. And then the next issue, no one cares about. And it's like, what does that mean for those creators? What does that mean for the story they're trying to tell when their income is not reliable? When, and what does it mean for, for casual fans when suddenly it's like, oh, I can't get that comic because everyone scooped it up and flipped it online for a ton of money. Like we talked about it before. That's the, the problem that we see with a lot of speculation stuff is the scarcity impacts the the worst, uh, the casual fan who then can't read a story and then doesn't buy the next issue. And they're the reliable customers. Like the guy who comes in to get uh, Stray Dogs number two, fifth printing or whatever, if he doesn't get it, we haven't lost a customer. Right. He'll be back next week for the next hot book and hopefully yeah. he can get that for cover price. But, you know, the person who wanted that issue of Usagi Yojimbo, uh, they can't get it because everyone snapped it up because that's the Usagi that's going to be in the cartoon on Netflix. And that guy has to wait a month or more to get a new printing. Maybe he stops reading Usagi because it's such a pain now. Yeah. Like, and then he doesn't buy any more Usagi stuff and multiply that out across a different title every single week in this industry. So, yeah, that's... It's weird to see it, it not a comics thing but something so similar to what we go through that it's like oh god this is just this is the world now this is just scarcity and collectibles and youtube and that's it that's the the, insert the subject matter yeah that doesn't matter yeah that youtube is creating fomo and then like activating a ton of people and like it only takes one guy being popular with like you could make a ton of money with this for a feeding frenzy to start and then suddenly like a bunch of other people are doing shows like that and then suddenly everyone's like, no, there really is value to these books now because all of these guys are doing these shows and everyone's going out and buying them. And it, it's it's a nightmare. And it's uh, both uh, calming and also aggravating to find out that it is not unique to comics, that it is everywhere. One of the things that the Key Collector guy had said was that, you know, they have a hot list, but they don't mean those books are hot as invaluable. They just mean... Hey, these are coming out, and you might not know it, so we're going to put it here. <laughs> and all I thought was, that's not what there it are means. a million places for people to find out what's new this week. I guarantee you, everybody who shops at a local comic store, that comic store has a new release list available online in store. You want to know what's coming out? There, yeah. hot, go there. Hot and go new to your stores are not synonymous. Yeah, <laughs> you know what words mean, and you know that calling something hot means something different than calling something new. But I mean, it doesn't stay on the hot list because they'll they'll take it out after it's not new. Then it's just new. Yeah, but it's not. It's hot, and that means something else, and you know it. But anyway, just to summarize, that is not an app for speculators. It's just for giving information. Sure. What people do with that information, he can't control that. That's right. Everyone's hands are clean. That's Uh, right. You know, I meant to mention this earlier. We were talking about Kickstarter a little bit, and by this time next week, we will have a new Kickstarter up and active, and you'll find out more about it very soon. Until then... Thanks for listening. Keep reading comics. This has been Contest of Challengers. Thanks for listening. Keep reading comics. Challengers is located at 1845 Northwestern Avenue in the Bucktown neighborhood of Chicago. 773-278-0155. Keep up to date with new releases and events at challengerscomics.com. Like Challengers Comics on Facebook. Follow at Challengers on Twitter. And help fund this podcast at patreon.com slash challengers.